to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel the of christ spreading the soul-saving message of and jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ stand therefore having girded your waist with the truth, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14. Welcome to our series of soul-saving lessons. One of the most important things that a person can get a hold of and learn to make sure that his soul is right with God is the importance of truth. The proverb writer said, Buy the truth and sell it not. Proverbs 23 and verse 23. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said, You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. John chapter 8 and verse 32. And it was Jesus who clearly taught us that the Word of God is truth. Sanctify them, Jesus prayed to the Father, by your truth, your Word, is truth. John chapter 17 and verse 17. And so while we think about the importance of standing on the truth, let's clearly understand what we mean today. This doesn't mean that in standing on the truth, we have the right to be unkind or mean-spirited. That's not at all what the Bible teaches. Yes, we must contend earnestly for the faith, Jude verse 3. Yes, we must reprove and show the unfruitful works of darkness, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11. But in so doing, our motives must be right. The Bible tells us we must speak the truth in love. It's true that no one really cares or knows, wants to know how much you know until they know how much you care. Understand today that in speaking about standing, the importance of standing on the truth, our motive is the truth in love. More than anything, we want people to go to heaven. This doesn't mean that there aren't sincere people, sincere religious people in the world today. There are multitudes of sincere religious people, but it's possible to be sincere and be sincerely wrong. Romans 10 verses 1 and 2, Paul said of his own countrymen, of some of the Jews, that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. There are people who are sincere, who are zealous, who want to please God, and don't have the truth to do that with. Romans chapter 6 verse 17 says we must obey from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered by God. We must do only what the scriptures say to be right with the Father. And so standing on the truth means that we speak the truth in love even when there are sincere people who are sincerely wrong. We want those people to be right with God and have the hope of heaven. Well, how is it then? How does a person stand on the truth? Well, what are some things I need to know to be able to stand on the truth? What does it really mean? Standing on the truth means that we must study and say what our Lord and His apostles taught. I've got to study the Bible and I've got to make sure that I say what the Lord and His apostles taught, that I live my life by that. The importance of study is clearly seen in the Scripture. If I'm going to stand on the truth, I've got to study the truth. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, the Scripture says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I want to study the Bible so I can be right and be approved in God's sight. Oh, how I love the example of the Bereans. Notice this scripture from Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. The Bible says, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Look at their example. They had a readiness of mind. They wanted to know God's will, and yet when what was claimed to be truth was presented, they searched the scriptures, the real book of truth, to make sure they were right with God. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 26 tells us, the heart of the righteous 
studies how to answer. Isaiah 34 and verse 16, we're told to search in the book of the law of God and see if these things are true. We as God's people must be like the great scribe Ezra. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to do it and to teach its statutes and judgments in all Israel. We must prepare our heart, come to the Bible and say, I'm going to study this book and whatever Jesus and whatever His inspired men taught, that's what I'm going to do. As we think about standing on the truth, we also stand on it by saying, only what the Bible says. Not only do I stand on it by studying what God's Word says, I stand on truth by saying what the Bible says. I love the words of Jeremiah 37 verse 17. An evil king asked a wonderful question. To Jeremiah he said, Is there any word from the Lord? Paul in Romans 4 verse 3 mentions this same idea. What does the Scripture say? What has God said about the matter? Is there any word from the Lord? Where can we find it at in the Bible? That needs to be our mindset if we're really going to stand on the truth. In John chapter 2 and verse 5, the mother of Jesus made a wonderful statement that really ought to kind of be the motto for every Christian. As Jesus is about to perform the first miracle, the turning of the water to wine, she looks at the servants and says this, Whatever He says to you, do it. Can you find better advice in the Bible than that? Whatever Jesus says to me, I'm going to do it. I don't have to question. I don't have to put my preconceived ideas in there. If Jesus says it, I'm going to do it. 2 Peter 1 verse 3 tells us that in the Scriptures, God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowledge of Him who called us. Here's the good news. All I need is the Bible. When I stand upon the truth, not only am I doing the right thing, this is all I need. It is the inspired Word of God. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, it is truth. John 17 verse 17, and it is all truth. I love the words of Psalm 119, verse 60. The psalmist said it so precisely. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Did you hear that from Genesis 1-1 to the very last word in Revelation 22? The entirety of it is God's truth. Now, here's the application. If I'm going to study what the Lord and His disciples taught, and I'm going to say what they say in the Bible, then I must not go beyond that which is written. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6, I will only be blessed if I do the things that are written in the book. Revelation 22 verses 14, I, I will only be right with God if I don't add to or take away from the words written in this book. Revelation 22 verses 18 and 19. And so how do we stand on truth? By studying what the Lord and His disciples taught and by saying, only what the Bible says in Scripture. Well, someone says, well, why is it so important that we stand in truth? Why must we today stand in truth? Here's why. It's very simple. Our God has told us to. 1 Kings chapter 22, the Scripture says, we must not turn from the right hand or to the left. We must only do what God says. And remember the words of Mary in John 2, 5? Whatever He says to you, do it. God created me. I didn't create Him. He is our Creator. Genesis 1-1. He is the Father of our spirits. Hebrews 12 verse 9. He is the one on the judgment day whom I will give an account to. John 12 48. Revelation 20 verses 12 through 15. And so why must I stand on the truth? Simply because God has told me to. He's my Creator. I'm submissive to Him and I must do His will. But here's another reason. I need to stand on the truth because standing on the truth is the only way we can know we're saved. How can you be sure that you're saved? A feeling isn't right. There were people in the Bible who had feelings, but they were wrong. Acts chapter 23 and verse 1, Paul said, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Does that mean in Acts chapter 7, when Saul was holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen, he felt like it was right? 
You bet he did. Was he right? Absolutely not. He was wrong. The only way we can know we're saved is by standing on the truth. Look at the beautiful words of 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. What comfort this ought to give us. The scripture says, These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, notice that you may know you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Why did John say that he wrote? So that you could think, so that you could feel, so that you could have an idea maybe? Oh no. John said, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Standing on the truth is about knowing that I'm right with God. Jesus again said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. The equation there is, if I know the truth, I can know I'm free and I can know that I'm right with God. You see, God has not left us without exact details, without clear idea, a clear teaching on how to be right with Him. Jesus said, and this was relating to worship, but Jesus said in John 4, 24, that God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. If I must worship correctly, there's got to be somewhere where I can find out how to do that. And that is the Word of God. Ephesians 5, 17 tells us, do not be ignorant, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so why must I stand on truth? Simply put, God's in control. He told me to. But there's another motivating reason, and don't ever forget this. When I'm standing on the truth, that's the only way that I can know that I'm saved. That's the only way I can know that I'm right with God. Well, if we did stand on truth, if we took this book and we said, I'm going to stand upon its teaching. I'm going to say what it says. I want to make sure I'm right with God. What would we teach if we stood on the truth? Here are some things. We would teach the unique and distinct identity of the Lord's church. Listen carefully. The Lord did not create a religious group on every street corner. He didn't create 500, 600, 3,000. He didn't create all these religious groups. The Lord's church is unique and distinct from every other group that exists today. How do we know that? Listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi and has asked his disciples saying, who do men Say that I, the Son of Man, am. Great compliment to these prophets, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the, John the Baptist, one of the prophets. And he said, well, who do you say that I am? Peter spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood's not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I say to you that you're Peter, you're a small stone, but on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. What did Jesus promise to build? Did Jesus promise to build a multitude of religious groups on a multitude of religious rocks for anybody's idea or feeling today? Not at all. Jesus said, I will build my church. What makes the church of the Lord unique and distinct? It's built upon and by Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus has to be the foundation. Notice the words of 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. The scripture says, For no other foundation can anyone lay except that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. What does that passage teach us? That Jesus must be the foundation. And, and understand, Jesus can't be the foundation if we've based it off of men's teaching, if we base our religion off of things that aren't in the Scripture. Jesus Himself said that the body was the church. God put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body. Ephesians 1, 21 through 23. And so the church is the body. How many churches are there in Scripture? How many bodies are there? You turn over just two chapters, or three chapters, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, there is one body. Now listen carefully. If the church is the body, and there's only one body, how many churches are there? Well, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 teaches us, By one Spirit we're all baptized into one body. 
God has never been pleased with religious division. Paul said, I pray that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Let there be no divisions. Jesus prayed that they would all be one. John 17, 20 and 21. How can it be the case? that all these religious groups are right when they don't follow the teaching of God, when they don't wear the name or the distinct characteristics of the Lord's church, when they're not worshiping and following the Bible. And so if we're really going to stand on the truth, this means we've got to understand the unique and distinct identity of the Lord's church. Secondly, if we stood on the truth, we would teach the absolute and final authority of the Scriptures. In talking to people sometimes about religious matters, matters especially relating to authority, we get many different views, many different ideas. Some will say, well, the Apostolic Fathers, after the writing of the New Testament, gave us some ideas. Some say, well, we've got tradition and that's been passed down. Others will say, well, all the art and the things of this that came down from the Fathers and all this of history, that's just as much authoritative as anything. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible makes it abundantly clear there is one source of authority and only one. That's the Scriptures. Jesus has the final say today. I want you to notice the words of Matthew 28 verse 18. Look at what the Lord and Savior said. Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then He said, You go and make disciples of all nations. Notice that. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Who has all authority? Jesus does. Can you have more than all? Absolutely not. If Jesus has all and He's still reigning from heaven, the right hand of God, Hebrews 1 verse 4, He's still King of kings and Lord of lords, Revelation 19, 16, then that doesn't leave us any authority on our own. Colossians 3, 17 says, Whatever you do, and He clarifies, in word or in deed, do all. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now, what's it mean to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus? Does that mean I can just throw my hands up in the air and say, In Jesus' name, and that be right with God? Acts chapter 4, verse 7 is divine commentary on understanding this. John, Peter and John were asked, By what name or by what authority have you done these things? One's name is the authority. If someone says, Stop in the name of the law. Police officer says you stop in the name of the law. You understand he's got the authority to do that. Jesus tells us we must do all by his name or by his authority. Remember 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6? The Bible teaches, listen, I, I wish you'd really think about this for just a minute. Paul said we're not to go beyond that which is written. Let's lay up some barriers. Where does the Bible say is the barrier for authority? One side of the Scripture and on the other. And only in between that is our authority today. If we're not to go beyond which is written, we can't go outside the pages of this book for our authority. If we do, we're not going to be right with God. The proverb writer said in Proverbs 30 verse 6, Do not add to his word lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. I don't have the right to put something in here that I want or feel is right. I don't have the right to take away. Whoever takes away from the things written in this book, God will take away his name from the book of life. Revelation 22 verses 18 and 19. But think for just a minute about a, an example. In Scripture of two men who didn't realize the importance of God's authority. In Leviticus chapter 10 verses 1 and 2, the scripture tells us that Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire on it, and offered unauthorized or profane fire before the Lord, and watch this, which he had not commanded them. And the scripture says fire went out from the Lord and they died that day. What did these men do wrong? They took unauthorized fire, profane, and they did that which God had not commanded them. There's a wake-up call. If I don't want to be like Nadab and Abihu, I need to make sure that I only do that which is commanded, only do that which is authorized, and that is what it means to really stand on the truth. Now, another practical principle from standing on the truth means that in our worship, 
We must only worship God in the way that He Himself has authorized. And understand that instrumental music is not authorized by God. Remember, we're living under the New Testament. John 12, verse 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me and, and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. When I stand before God, I'm not going to be judged by the words of Moses. I'm not going to be judged by what David or Noah or any of those people in the old law did. I'm going to be judged by the words of Christ. I'm living under the New Testament. If that's the case, what does the New Testament say about instrumental music or mechanical instruments of music and worship? God has not asked for it. And what God has not commanded, we must not do. Colossians chapter 3 helps us with this idea. I want you to notice what the scripture says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. What has God asked for in singing? Here it is. The Bible says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What am I to do? I'm going to let the words of Christ dwell richly. I'm to teach. I'm to admonish. I'm to let the words of Christ be in my heart. And I'm to make melody. Ephesians 5.19. I'm to make melody where? On an organ or a piano or a drum set or a guitar? No, God said, make melody in your heart. We today worship God in spirit and truth by doing what 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15 says. We sing with the spirit and we sing with the understanding. That's how God has asked us to sing today. God doesn't want us to do things that aren't right. We understand this principle. I believe in every other area of life that the principle that God only wants what He asks for, and yet when it comes to the Bible, we can't seem to get it, and yet we understand it in daily, in daily life. Let me illustrate. Let's say that you're going to order a pizza, and you call down to the local pizza shop called Pizza Hut, and you say, I'd like to order a large pizza with pepperoni and black olives. I want that delivered. You give me your address, and in about 30 minutes, the doorbell rings. The fella gets there, he's holding the pizza, it's hot, it's warm, it smells good. You take it inside, uh, you open it up, and you look at it, and it has pepperoni and black olives, but it's also got pineapple and anchovies on it. And you look at the fella and you say, now wait a minute, I said I wanted pepperoni and black olives. I didn't say I wanted these things. How would you respond if he said, you didn't tell us not to? Would you pay for that? Would you take that and be happy? The very fact that you specified what you wanted excludes all else. And when God says, sing, make melody in the heart, God didn't then have to come along and say, and don't play an organ, and don't play a piano, and don't play a guitar. When God told us what He wanted, that was all He wanted. And again, we understand that in other areas of life, and we need to apply it to the teaching of Scripture. Another area that we would stand upon if we really stood firmly on the truth was the fact that there cannot be unity in diversity. We live in a world that says, you're going your way and I'm going my way and we're all going to the same place. Uh, is that true? Are we all taking different roads to the same place? It's not what the scripture says. Matthew 7 verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who are going down it, but narrow is the gate, difficult, restricted is the way that leads to eternal life, and few there are who find it. Two cannot walk together unless they are agreed. Amos 3 verse 3, And man cannot walk hand in hand with God if he's not following God's principles. How did they do it in the first century? That's what we want to ask. How did they do it in the Bible? Acts 2 verse 42 tells us, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. They did what the inspired men of God did. Oh, how we need to learn a lesson today. God does not want unity and diversity. God wants unity in the bond of peace, His Word, Ephesians 4 and verse 3. We need to realize that God desires unity. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Jesus prayed in John 17, 20 and 21 that they would all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they all be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. God does not want men divided 
persecuted and all these religious groups, God wants us to come to the Bible, speak the same thing, be of the same mind, and do what He says. Another principle that we would teach, if we stood on the truth, is the absolute essentiality of baptism, meaning that a person cannot be saved one second before he's baptized. Does the scripture teach that? Most in our religious world don't. But does the Bible teach baptism is absolutely essential to salvation? Listen to the words of scripture. The Bible makes it abundantly clear. When Peter was asked men, by the Jews, what must we do? The answer was repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. If baptism is for the remission of sins, and if I can't live with God unless my sins are removed, and I can't be saved before baptism. Acts 22 verse 16, Saul was told, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Look at how clear Jesus made it in Mark chapter 16 verse 16. You need help to misunderstand this. Notice the clarity of Jesus' words. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Must I believe and be baptized to be saved? Well, that's exactly what Jesus said. Both requirements but must be met prior to salvation. Galatians 3 verse 27 says, we're baptized, we're, when we're baptized, we clothe ourselves with Christ. We're baptized into Christ. Well, why is that important? All spiritual blessings are in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3. Salvation is in Christ, 2 Timothy 2, verses 10 through 12. And if I'm baptized into Christ, then I can't have those a moment before. Are you standing on the truth today? Are you sure that you're right with God? Have you obeyed God's plan of salvation? Are you a part of the unique and distinct church that you read about in the Bible, we're praying and we're hoping today that you will take this lesson to heart and that you'll decide, I want to stand on the truth and be right with God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.